Hello and welcome back, royal family. I am in another living room. I'm like the traveling pastor here. So I am in uh, the house of Chris and Sean's house in Georgia. Let me get settled in here. And we're getting ready to do another Bible study. I'm actually filming this one on a Friday for all you Catholics out there. And I'm going to upload it on a Sunday. But uh, <laughs> just a little joke. Relax. We're not going in that direction. Let me open up my tablet. There we go. So we are good. We, it is uh, the 4th of April, which means it is Resurrection Sunday. And that is when this message is going up. This is our resurrection message this year in the year of our Lord 2021. We are going to take a moment of silent prayer in a moment because we know in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth, and like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow, I may grow, we all may grow in respect to our salvation. We want to remember 1 John 1, 9, when we're washing sin away, we want to reflect the nature of Jesus Christ, that is putting on the new nature, taking off the old, where it says, if you say you have no sin, you are deceiving yourselves. The truth is not in you in 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive your sins, cleansing you from all unrighteousness, which means sins you didn't even realize. And if you say you have not sinned, you make him a liar. So we're not going to do that. We're going to jump into the word of God. I want to take a moment of silent prayer. And I actually want to keep the military has been on my heart a lot lately. And it just keeps pressing when I pray at night, when I put my notes together. Um, it saddens me, like I tell people all the time, that uh, a lot of Army guys in my family and uh, got one or two Marines in there, a couple of Air Force, a few law enforcements and my cousins. But a lot of uniforms in my family, and it saddens me that there's uh, a lot of um, feminization of the military going on in a bad way. Um, I love the ladies serving and whatnot, but um, they're just uh, the things that are going on and uh, that are the, the decisions our government is making towards our military are going to be really detrimental to us in the long run. And I have great concerns about that. We, uh, you know, we have that thin blue line of the police officers. That protect us on the street and the other the other line we have is the green line is the military line that's the line that that protects us from our outside enemies and uh if we're not strong and we're not fierce our enemies will be able to trample us so i do have great concerns about the military that's where my heart's been i know many of you out there have, uh, have sent me emails and information about things and i try to keep up the what's going on in the social and political atmosphere out there and uh I just want to keep them in prayer. I think the next couple lessons, it's going to be about the military, but I do want to pray about the viruses and anything else going on in the world. I want to shout out to the North Carolina folks that helped me out on the road. I want to give a prayer today for the family helping me out here in Georgia as we make our last leg of the tour down into Florida and get ready to deal with that down there. So as I say that, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Let's, uh, let's wash the sin away and let's say a prayer for everything. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, right now it's been pressing on my heart about the United States military. And Father, the changes that are going on with the men and women in the military. And we need to pray for our leadership. We need to pray for all of our leadership, certainly the seat of our president, whether we agree with what's going on or not. We need to pray for the safety. And we need to pray for him to make godly decisions and those in leadership to make godly decisions, Father. And we just ask that those young men and women that are Christians out there, that are wearing the uniforms, just stay strong. Stay strong in what they believe. Stay strong to protect our Constitution here in America, Father. And maybe they can influence and touch those other soldiers and sailors and airmen around them that do not believe and do not know the Word of God and do not realize nationalism is so important. Father, we're asking these things. We're asking for your healing hand across this world with vaccines and viruses. And Father, we're asking you to touch these families that have helped my wife and I on this journey to move down to Florida, Father. Without them, it would have been much more costly, much more frustrating and exhausting. And because of them, I'm able to do these type of messages. We thank them and want a blessing to go to all of them. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to jump into it. Resurrection Sunday 2021 is the title. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with me, royal family. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Don't mind if I shift around a little bit and get comfortable. Uh, we will be doing the Lord's Supper at the end of the message, so if you did want to hit a stop button, go get yourself some cracker and juice, 
uh, symbolic for the wine and the bread, you can go ahead and do that. But we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As prophecy teaches us, and Jesus' own words tells us that he would be crucified, and after three days and three nights, he would be resurrected, as is the case and always is the case. God's word never comes back unfulfilled. And so on that divine Sunday morning over 2,000 years ago, the Feast of First Fruits took on the reality we celebrate today. For several hundred years afterward, the Sunday morning after Passover was known to Christians as Resurrection Morning. Until what? Until Satan implemented his scheme to confuse Christians by incorporating a pagan worship system known as Easter, which revolved around fertility symbols, rituals that many of you are aware of. We've touched on them before in the past. The Lord rose from that grave over 2,000 years ago after three full days, three full nights, fulfilling the feast of first fruits. He is the first fruit of those that slept, and his resurrection confirmed his victory over sin and death. And ours too. For if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved which is from Romans chapter 10. I'll repeat that again because maybe it's time for an altar call. I haven't done one in a few lessons. If you know that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was resurrected, maybe you haven't heard that before. He is the first fruits of those that slept. And his resurrection confirmed his victory over sin and death and ours too. Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. So if you've never heard that before, you don't have to walk an aisle. You don't have to get dunked in a, a tank of water. You don't have to speak a tongue. You just simply have to believe the faith of a child. One Savior, one way to heaven. It is Jesus Christ, and it is Jesus only. His work, his name, that saves. With all of the confusion and questions in recent months concerning the rapid changes here in America and the obvious shift away from Christian principles at a rapid pace across the globe, I feel as though God the Holy Spirit wants to remind us of something today. I think the approach we will take on this Resurrection Sunday is one that reinforces just who we are in Christ. That our union with Him goes beyond applying His mind to our daily lives, but to the very resurrection we too are going to share in. Yes, you heard me. If you're a new believer on this channel and you just got born again and saved, you believed on Jesus Christ, welcome into the family. Our union with him, Jesus Christ, goes beyond applying his mind to our daily lives, but to the very resurrection, we too are going to share it. And because it is God and Jesus Christ and God the Holy Spirit, it's already done. As we look at the church at Corinth, do not forget the Greek culture wrapped up in this group of people. They had many struggles with emotional issues, sexual immorality, and they also struggled with the concept, concept excuse me, of resurrection. And this is why Paul is emphasizing a principle on resurrection, because of what certain beliefs were in that area of Corinth. And like I said, it was, had a strong Greek influence. 1 Corinthians 15.20 is where we're going to pick it up. 1 Corinthians 15.20. But the fact is, Paul says, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep, verse 21, for since by a man death came, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. Now Paul is making a strong statement here, matter of fact statement, not gossip, not hearsay. He is the guarantee, Jesus Christ, guarantee for all who have died that they will rise from the dead. The resurrection of Christ is the believer's guarantee of a physical bodily resurrection and we'll cover some of that today first corinthians 15 22 for as in adam all die so also in christ all will be made alive first corinthians 15 23 paul goes on to say but each in his own order christ the first fruits after those who are christ at his coming christ was the first resurrection the rapture of the church will follow with the resurrection of the Old Testament saints and tribulation believers to follow that. So God always has a divine order, a divine way, the right thing done in the right way. And even after that, the millennial, those believers will receive their resurrection body. So it is inevitable. In fact, the unbelievers also have a resurrection, which is really not something to rejoice about. 
or celebrate. And if you've come to believe in Jesus Christ with that altar call I gave you, you, you are welcomed into the royal family and you have no idea how great the blessings are. But it is always the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as the first fruit. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to our God and Father and when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. 1 Corinthians 15, 25. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. In 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. This means that Christ abolished death itself. That's what it means. Jesus Christ abolished death itself. Through his resurrection, death as we know it is gone. Karageo is the word you're looking at on the board there for will be abolished. Karageo means to end something completely, definitively, to be useless. And many times it was used for someone who was unemployed with, the, with, the hope, with no hope, really, of getting re-employed. They were useless in the community. It's a Greek present tense, meaning the present tense. Many of you are well-schooled. It was done and continually goes forward as complete. Always was, always will be, and will always be useless and done and finished. Jesus Christ abolished death. 1 Corinthians 15, 27. And again, I remind you, if you just become born again and saved, maybe you've never heard that. Death is abolished through Jesus Christ. You should rejoice in that. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is clear that this excludes the Father who put all things in subjection to him. And you see the Greek verb in this in 1 Corinthians 15, 27. Hupotasso is used twice in 1 Corinthians 15, 27. Used twice here where it tells you put all things in subjection under his feet and subjection under his feet. Hupotasso, the Greek verb is used twice. It is a military word, really. That's how they used it for captive or victory over an enemy. Very strong word. It points to authority in complete control. The enemy is in full submission, and it's used twice in that, in that sentence. That's why Paul would teach later on in the chapter, many of you know this, O oh death, he would ask, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? Because it's been abolished, it's been taken captive, it's abolished and removed. 1 Corinthians 15, 28, when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected all things to to him so that God may be all in all. This is speaking, interestingly enough, in past and as well as future tense, meaning God was always in control, will always remain in that position forever. God never lost his authority ever. The plan never got out of hand. God never worried about how am I going to deal with the death situation? How am I going to deal with the resurrection situation? It was done. From eternity past into the future, it is complete. 1 Corinthians 15, 29. For otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead, if the dead are not raised at all? Why then are they baptized for them? Paul begins to ask these questions. Verse 30, why are we also in danger every hour? And baptism, as many of you know, maybe you've not heard this, is simply identification with Christ. And every generation of believers in every dispensation, every age, identifies with Christ in a form of baptism. We recognize the baptism of the Holy Spirit as the only one now in the church age. And the words, why are we in danger, that Paul uses is actually one Greek term, kendunio, and is a present tense again, present tense indicating, keep on being in jeopardy, keep on having this danger. So why is he saying that? It means to be in danger. Why are we in danger every hour? It doesn't mean that Paul is necessarily in danger every hour. That's not what it's speaking of. It means some believer could be facing adversity. It probably is somewhere across the world as I speak, as you sit here right now. If the resurrection did not occur, why is it that Christian life is one of the ones of lives we live that has cosmic attacks and all about spiritual warfare. What is it about then if the resurrection isn't real? In other words, those that were questioning and doubting on the resurrection, 
Paul is shutting them down. And there are believers right now as I speak that are under attack. The life of Paul illustrates that believers do face danger and run risks in this life. Why run risks if there's no resurrection? If it was a myth, if it was fake, if it was a fugazi as we used to say up in New England. The fact that believers will face danger and run risks is again a reality of the resurrection life we are called to live. All of us, if you're a believer, you're called to live a resurrection life actually. You need to be in your position. Oftentimes you hear me say position and condition. And your condition, don't worry about it. Dust it off and keep moving forward. Focus on that position and leave the condition behind. When we walk in that new nature and apply the word of God to our lives, we are reflecting our position. And in doing so, we give others glimpses of the resurrection life we live in for all of eternity. So maybe there's somebody that's mistreated you and because you're applying God's word and maybe you're showing a little fruit of the spirit, you're reflecting Jesus Christ. You're reflecting the resurrection life that you're called to walk right now in time. So let me say this again. When we walk in that new nature and apply the word of God to our lives, even in a small fraction, and you're going to stumble and fall, you're not going to get it right every day. But when you apply that word, walking in that new nature, we are reflecting our position and in doing so, we give others glimpses of the resurrection life we will live in for all of eternity. It's not a game. It's not a fake. It's factual, just as the resurrection is factual. 1 Corinthians 15, 27, 28 touches back into Old Testament Psalms, actually. Chapter 8, I'll put it on the board for you. It touches back in the Psalms chapter 8, 1 Corinthians 15, 27, 28, related to the believer, something we all need to remember. What is man that you think of him speaking to God and son of man that you are concerned about him? The rank and position we hold because of our union with Christ is something we should fully understand and learn to live in every day. I know we forget. I know we struggle. We all do. We all fall back into our condition. That's okay. Again, I remind you, 1 John 1, 9, it, dust it off. Keep moving forward. Get back in your position. In fact, one of the booklets I do want to do personally myself is to do a book on condition and position. And once you can master that doctrine and understand it, it's not going to make life a bed of roses. That's not what we're called here to do. We're called to a spiritual war. We're called to a race. This is not meant to be easy every day. But if you start to understand certain principles like your position and what condition means and position means, it makes life much easier, the spiritual life much easier. Our position is beyond this mere mortal body that we're all struggling. We were just sitting at the kitchen table having dinner with the royal family here talking about the aches and pains and the vitamins and stuff we need to have. Our position is beyond this mere mortal body, this temporal life that we struggle through down here on earth. The God of the universe thought about you and I. Look at Psalms 8. The God of the universe thought about you and I in eternity past and designed this incredible eternal plan for just all of us. Psalms 8, 5, it goes on to say, Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty, and you have him rule over the works of your hand. You have put everything under his feet. We are in union with Jesus Christ, believers this is speaking to you. We are in union with Jesus Christ. The God of the universe thought about you. I don't care what you think about yourself today. The God of the universe thought about you in eternity past, and he included you because he loves you in his plan. If Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead and there is no resurrection, there is no hope for any of us, folks. It's an important principle to understand. Don't ever let anybody in that secular system outside of these walls, outside of these doors, start to tell you that they doubt the resurrection because that's an intricate part of the plan of God. If Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead and he did not do the exact three full days, three full nights that he's not the savior we thought he is, then there is no resurrection, right? There is no hope for any of us. But we know from historic facts and accounts that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ arose from the dead after three full days and three nights. He never faltered. He never failed 
in any aspect of executing the perfect plan of God the Father. Matthew 12, 40 tells us for it. For just as Jonah was in the stomach of the sea monster, many think, think it's a whale, but I believe it's a prehistoric sea monster. For three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The nature of the resurrection body is truly, truly incredible. Again, if you're a new believer, you're going to get some gems here and things that are really going to open your eyes up. But the nature of the resurrection body is truly incredible. It is something we should focus on because it really takes all the confusion and lies we see every day in this fallen world and points to a spiritual perspective on our lives more important than our own future, human future right here. Because we have a divine future. Let me say that again. The nature of the resurrection body is truly incredible. It is something we should focus on because it really takes all this confusion, all the lies we see every day in this fallen world and points to a spiritual perspective on our lives. More importantly, our future lives, our spiritual lives, our eternal lives. Turn to the Gospel of John chapter 20 with me. I'm going to grab a drink here. Don't mind me bending over. John chapter 20 with me, royal family. The resurrection body, we can note from Scripture, should really be awe-inspiring, for lack of better words, and remove our concerns from the attacks and distractions of the devil's world. If you start thinking about this is what believers need to do, even if you're going through something and that depression or the lies of the cosmic system are hitting you, you need to focus on certain principles, this being one of them. This resurrection body is really, it, it's awe-inspiring when we think about it. The gifts that we're given, our union with Christ, and you should remove these concerns from the attacks and distractions of the devil's world because they're constantly going to come at you. So don't think they're not. That's why you need to not lose heart. Keep going forward in the plan of God and pick out these gems, these different messages that you realize that you're in union with Christ and that shows you in the Bible who you truly are. The resurrection body retained the nail prints in the hands and the feet. So it is a real body. It's not some kind of myth and mystical body. We know this prophetically from Psalms 22, 16, Zechariah 12, 10, Historically, from John chapter 20, I'll put that on the board, but the resurrection body is a real body, retain the nail prints in the hand and feet. We note this prophetically from Psalms 22, 16, Zechariah 12, 10, historically from John 20, 25, 29. And Jesus was recognized by, yes, doubting Thomas because of the scars on his hand and the scar and actually the wound in his side. John 20, 25. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. That is not a salvation issue there, folks. I'll point that out to you right now. John 20, 26. Eight days later, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with him. Jesus came, the doors having been shut and stood in their midst, said, peace be with you. In other words, they're saying the door shut, nobody could get in the room, and he just mysteriously appears. John 20, 27, then he said to Thomas, place your finger here and see my hands. Take your hand, put it into my side and do not continue to disbelief, but be a believer. Thomas was already born again and saved. This is not the issue, but this is an important principle for believers who doubt and sit on the fence. And we all do from time to time. We struggle with things. Thomas was already born again, but like so many believers, he was still at a place of setting human boundaries on the power of God. How many times have we done that? I know I can say amen to that. I'm sure there's some other amens out there. We put boundaries on just how much power God can have in this circumstance. You never can put God in a box. And Thomas had mental limitations in his own mind how far God could go and what power the Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ truly had. That's what this is really all about. Thomas was already born again and saved. How many times we as believers have been born again and saved 10, 15, 20 years and we have a little doubting Thomas episode like 
Yeah, this time it's just too much. It's too much for God. He can't come through this time. I've done too much. There's too much against me. There's too many. The odds are against me. God can't handle it. Says the un, says the, the 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 lacking believer, the Thomas mentality. While the God of the universe looks down on you and says, "Just wait. In my timing, my way, I'll be doing it." We all have a little doubting Thomas in all of us, okay? So get over yourself if you don't think you do and you want to put on a front. We all do. John 20, 28, Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord, my God. John 20, 29, Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have, have you now believed, he asked him. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. He's talking in coming in the future tense here, church age believers, with the faith enough to grow Move forward in the plan of God, disregarding what Satan puts in their path to confuse and hurt you. Yes, disregarding because your faith, your growth, you're moving forward. You're shedding that doubting Thomas. When he pops up, you take that thought captive, as Paul taught as well. Take that thought prisoner. But church age believers here are being highlighted with the faith enough to grow. Move forward in the plan of God, disregarding what Satan puts in your path to confuse and hurt you. Think about David and Goliath. That's always a great story to look at. 14, 15 year old David looking at a nine or a 10 foot giant warrior in front of him and all those grown men shaking in their boots behind him. That's faith. That's the, that's the faith we're talking about. Shed that doubting Thomas. Christ was recognized by his disciples as the one who died and rose again. There were 17 appearances of the resurrected Christ so in other words, the resurrection body does not destroy the image by which a person is remembered. This is kind of interesting, I found as well. That answers the question that in heaven we will look like ourselves, but it will be the perfect version of ourselves. So if you're having a bad day, if you're struggling, think about what you have coming just down the road. Well, I'm, I'm only 20 years old. I can live for another 60 years. That's nothing. That's a drop in the bucket. Think about what you have coming down the road. Christ was recognized by his disciples as the one who died and rose again. There were 17 appearances of the resurrected Christ. So in other words, the resurrection body does not destroy that image by which a person is remembered. That answers the question that in heaven we will look like ourselves, but it will be a perfect version of ourselves. Can you not rejoice and find some happiness in that? It will be possible to recognize people with a res resurrection body because it's the mind that retains the image. We're talking about soul structure. Your soul structure, your mind, your soul structure is who you truly are, not this fleshly body that's decaying. It's who you are in your thoughts, your mind, your soul structure, your norms and standards, those things that are inside of you. The resurrection body of Christ could eat and drink Luke 24, 42, 43. Not that he needed to, but he could. Luke 24, 42, they served him a piece of broiled fish. Verse 43, he took it and ate it in front of them. Christ's resurrection body had substance, in other words. It could be touched and felt. Matthew 28, 9 shows us that. Luke 24, 39, John 20, 17, all display those. Luke 24, 39. See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you plainly see that I have. Also noted in Matthew 28, 9 and John 20, 17. Christ's resurrection body could breathe, not necessarily that he needed to do that all the time. John 20, 22. His re resurrection body possessed Flesh and bones, Luke 24. His resurrection body could walk through closed doors. I just showed you, Luke 24, 36, John 20, 19. Now when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut, where the disciples were together due to the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst. The doors were shut. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you, and you see that as well, Luke 24, 36. The reason they highlight and emphasize the doors being shut, it really means the room was sealed, and yet Christ just walked right through. You and I, 
will have abilities to do these things. The resurrection body was able to appear and disappear. The resurrection body of Christ could move vertically, horizontally, disappear, reappear. Matthew 28, 10, Acts 1, 9, 9 and 10 actually. The two women who found the empty tomb at sunrise were devoted followers of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, one being Mary Magdalene, and Jesus appeared right in front of them, just like in a snap of a finger. Matthew 28, 8, and they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report his disciples at verse 9, and behold, Jesus met them, appearing in front of them and said, Rejoice. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Everything the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has proven to be able to do in that resurrection body, we have that guarantee through our union with him to also be able to do in eternity. Do you realize the powers we're given at the moment of salvation? So many things happen at the moment of salvation. Things that we're going to live in positionally. Everything the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has been proven to be able to do in that resurrection body, we have a guarantee through our union with him to also be able to do in eternity. Allah does not give his followers that. Buddha teaches you can come back as a, a fly or a squirrel, maybe another creature, but not yourself. Sun Young Moon, he does not offer you this unique power, this unique union, as does the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We can rest assured in all that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did. It's not just bedtime stories and myths, but historical facts, and we can count on every word in the Bible holding truth to the highest standard. Acts 1.9 says what? And after he had said these things, he was lifted up, you know the ascension, while they were watching and a cloud took him up out of their sight. Verse 10, and as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going. And behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. The promise of who the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is and how he will return are just as solid, factual as his life, death, and resurrection. We can trust in the resurrection. Therefore, my friends, I'm telling you, you can trust in the rapture of the church. You can trust in the seven-year tribulation period, the second advent, the millennial reign in heaven and your resurrection body in heaven. Acts 1.11 goes on to say, and they say, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you've watched him go into the heaven. He will return first in the clouds of the air to do what? Gather his bride in the rapture. He will return first in the clouds of the air, to gather his bride in the rapture. And I believe some of this UFO chatter we're hearing from our government and the news media outlets are going to try to explain away the rapture when it does come. And in the second advent, his feet will touch the earth at the second advent and return as the great warrior king first and foremost and end the seven-year tribulation period. A lot of people don't realize the skinny hippie that got beat up all the time, that's a false narrative. When he comes back, oh no, you'll see the warrior king and you'll see whole armies be slain with one word, one breath when he returns for the second advent after the seven-year tribulation period. We are by his side, in fact, during that. We're always by his side and we all receive his power, his royalty and a resurrection body as well. Witness after witness, account after account, tell us Christ was resurrected because he was, we are as well. Because he was resurrected, we are as well. The Apostle Paul speaks to the vast amount of witnesses of the first resurrection in some of his teachings, 1 Corinthians 15, 6. After that, he appeared to more than, what, 500 brothers and sisters at one time most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep, meaning they've gone away, obviously passed away. Verse 7, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Verse 8, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also, Paul said. Paul had a unique uh, encounter with the Lord, and he had a unique 
rapturing of himself up into the third heaven. That's a, probably a lesson for another day. And remember, if there's any apostles out there teaching you, I would be kind of shocked and awe because the apostles walked and talked with the Lord. It was only 12 of them, folks. I want to get ready to honor our Lord by bringing him into remembrance. And as we do, I want to list important principles we all can rest and get, find assurance and rest and joy in. And it has to do with the resurrection. The resurrection of Christ assures us God has accepted Christ's sacrifice for our sins. There's an assurance in that. That's called propitiation. God is satisfied. The resurrection puts a stamp, a seal of satisfaction on that. The resurrection of Christ assures us there is life after death. There is life after death. And as a believer, you receive that resurrection body. The lies of the cosmic system, the false religions that teach otherwise are nothing but satanic distractions. Do not be pulled aside. Do not get caught in that doubting Thomas attitude that we saw a little earlier. Your salvation is secured. Your sins have been fully paid for. Your position is sealed in eternity. Accept it. Rejoice in it. Find some happiness and move forward in that no matter what is going on in your life. The resurrection assures us that Christ is with us in the present. The resurrection assures us that we have an advocate, a mediator in heaven working always in our favor. Old Testament or New Testament, we have many promises related to just this. Joshua 1.9, it says what? Have I not commanded you? The question is, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God will what? Is with you wherever you go. With you wherever you go. Old Testament and New Testament. Isaiah 41.10, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. New Testament, Matthew 28, 20. I'm with you to the end of the age. Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Romans 8, 38, 39. Nothing will separate us from the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The resurrection assures us of the necessary power to live as God requires. The resurrection assures us of the new bodies we can someday have and we can learn to live a resurrection life right now, reflect what's coming in the future. The resurrection assures us of the returning Redeemer King. All of those things wrapped up. Matthew 28, 18 tells us, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to Christ. Verse 19, he told them, go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He gives us the power we have to believe. We need to remove that doubting Thomas from our mind. Luke 10, 19, behold, he said, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Luke 10, 19, let's hear that one again. Behold, I have given you authority, believers, to tread on serpents and scorpions. I know he was talking to the apostles. Not just the apostles, though. To us today. I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. Do you have the faith to go forward and tread on serpents and scorpions? Over all the power of your enemies, nothing shall hurt you. Luke 10, 19. 2 Peter 1, 3. His divine power has granted to us all things, underline all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence. That is what we should live in right now in time. That is what we should live in right now in time. Not the fear of the lies of the cosmic system, the attacks against your beliefs that we all face day in, day out, so that we can go home and be a doubting Thomas. Don't live in that. Live right now, reflecting the future in your position. Not the fear and the lies of the cosmic system attacking your beliefs at every corner, every turn. We've been given authority and power in union with Jesus Christ. We are assured of eternal life where there is no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears. The confusion and adversity 
is only temporary in this life. 80 years, 100 years is a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. Because of who Jesus Christ is and what he accomplished, we are lifted up on high, higher than angels. I know in your present condition, it might not seem like that, but in your position, you are lifted up higher than angels. He has risen, amen, and he is the risen savior of the scriptures. Because he is, we are promoted into the heavens in union with him. He has risen, and he is the risen savior of the scriptures. And because he is, we are promoted into the heavens in union with him. Let us focus on that cross and the resurrection today and the love of our Lord and Savior and pray we can love one another in such a selfless fashion as to give up ourselves for we know the calling of our Lord is upon our lives. If we choose to go forward, he's a perfect gentleman. You can stay stagnant. You can stay a doubting Thomas or you can go forward and tread on serpents and face your enemies. We're not called to a life of fear and confusion. I know Satan wants you to believe it, but we're not called to a life of fear and confusion, but courage and strength to walk in a position of the first fruits as our Lord did, a resurrected life in time. Let us be prepared for the Lord's Supper now. I will read from the writing of the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night which he was betrayed, he took bread, and as I take mine, you may take yours. He took bread, he broke it, and gave thanks, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In remembrance of our Lord, we are preparing to eat the bread. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed, let us eat the bread. Paul went on to say in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five 25, in the same way, he took the cup, as I am taking this right now, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In remembrance of our Lord, let us drink the cup. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come to study your word. And, and Father, we're just going to this Resurrection Sunday, and we want to walk forward without the doubting Thomas in our life, Father. We want to go forward in a resurrection life. We want to recognize what we have coming in our position. We realize the condition and the attacks all around us are going to be there, Father. But give us the strength to move forward and focus on that position Focus on that resurrection body that is right around the corner, Father. We know the time is short. We know it is time to get serious in your word. If there's anybody that has heard this message today and they've believed on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, welcome them in, Father. Give them the power to go forward and face the enemies and the adversity every day, Father. We're asking these things and remembering our precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.